It's okay, this is going to be really fun. <laughs> the book of Levitic. So fun, we're going to hear it again. Right, I feel like you're all very far back. I feel like there's like, that is the place to be this morning, isn't it? <laughs> wow. Anyway, um, we're going to be in Leviticus this morning, and it's not often that I steal Andy Johnston's jokes, uh, but at the start of his yeah. preach that I heard him practice... He said that Leviticus is the graveyard of every Bible in a year plan, which I thought was very, very appropriate. Who else has, fall, who else has fallen in Leviticus before? Like you've said, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to smash you. I'm going to do the whole Bible in a year. And then you've got to this point, and uh, <laughs> it's too hard. And I do wonder why that is. And I think partly it's because Genesis and Exodus, for some, even though there's, there's the same barriers that Leviticus has around like our understanding of what's going on and our kind of, it feels a bit unfamiliar, the, uh, the pace has been high. The action's been pretty fast-paced. We've gone through hundreds of years of history in one book. We've done incredible events. And then we get to Leviticus, and it kind of, the thrills kind of die down. The pace slows. And suddenly we find this whole book dedicated to just a handful of people within the, the nation of Israel. And it hones right in on one particular spot. It's like the camera zoomed in on a specific moment. We've had the, the breakneck recap at the start of the episode, and now we just have this long sort of, it's got kind of like in your favorite TV series, right in the middle of the series, you get like a filler episode. It feels kind of like that when you hit Leviticus. But I do think a big part of why we struggle as well is because as it slows down, we are also confronted with a load of stuff that for us as modern readers seems a bit boring, seems a bit irrelevant, seems a bit uneventful. And so we're presented with a choice, aren't we? We either skip Leviticus altogether and we go on to the, the action, elsewhere. We skim it. We kind of decide to try and just understand briefly what's going on. We do something like watch a video like that and we think, okay, I kind of know what Leviticus is about now. Or we can dig in. Or we can dive in and we can ask ourselves, even though it's really strange, what part is this book playing in the big picture story of what God is doing throughout the Bible? Now, I don't think there are many, and, and I think it's important to ask that because I don't think there'd be many people who would agree with us that Leviticus is something to be skipped over or skimmed over. I don't think actually, particularly in the Jewish faith, many people would say Leviticus isn't all that important and you can just skip right over it. In fact, for them, it's hugely significant. For original readers and hearers of Leviticus, the contents of this book are life and death. In fact, am I doing something funny, Ross? Am I stood too close to the speakers? Is that me? It normally is. If I come further back, does that help or does it make it worse? Is that right? Seems to, that seems to have worked, doesn't it? Great. Um, yeah, for, in fact, in, in Leviticus, we see God kind of laying out the different ways they live for him. And if they get those things wrong, that results in their death. And that happens 27 times. Uh, sorry, that happens 15 times. And there's only 27 chapters. So every other chapter, on average, through Leviticus, you hit a moment where if God's people don't pay attention and do this, they're at risk of dying. And that's because the key question in Leviticus is this. How can a holy, perfect God dwell with a sinful and imperfect people? How can a holy, perfect God dwell with a sinful and imperfect people? I don't know if you've ever had access to somewhere in your life that it felt like you should never have been able to get near. Uh, here's a, a picture of a holiday. Me and Ali went on uh, to Singapore in 2017. And for two nights of our stay there, we stayed in that hotel, the big tall towers, the Marina Bay Sands. If you've ever watched kind of World's Nicest Hotels, it was on there for an episode of that. It's very, very, very posh. We managed to bag ourselves this incredible room way up in the middle tower. It had incredible views out of both sides to the, the city of Singapore. And then out the back, you've got the gardens by the bay, which are just stunning. Uh, the bars and the restaurants serve the most incredible food. It was out of this world. And to top it all off, what runs along the top there uh, is a sky bar with an infinity pool that looks out. And you can literally sort of lean on the back of the infinity pool and it looks like you're up in the sky. Uh, I've never been somewhere so out of my normal world before. Uh, it was untrue. And never have we felt so out of place in any location. It, in fact, it was so expensive and over the top that at multiple moments throughout our stay there, we both kind of caught each other's eye and just went, it's a bit much, isn't it? Like we, we, we wanted to have fun, but this, this feels a bit, bit far. And you might be wondering, how did you guys manage that? Ali's just talked about a faith step that we took last year where I went part-time and Ali works for a charity. You might now be looking around wondering, are these guys part of some kind of crazy scheme that is quite crooked and like, where's your tithes going? You should probably be asking some questions to this guy. Don't worry, no such scheme exists. And in fact, our, our next holiday is to a little knockoff centre parks in North Wales. So that gives you an idea of where we are now. But how did we do it? How did we get there? 
Well, Ali's granddad, not long before he passed away, he gifted us some money and he said he was the kind of character that would say this kind of thing. He said, I don't want you to use it on boring things like deposits for a house or put it in your savings. I want you to go and have fun. I want you to go and enjoy yourself. And so we'd already booked this holiday, but as part of the holiday, we splashed out on a couple of nights in this hotel. His generosity allowed us to get access to somewhere that was way beyond what we could have been able to do in and of ourselves. And it's similar for us when it comes to our relationship with God. On our own, none of us could ever earn our way into God's presence. None of us have got enough. It's beyond us. In fact, Moses, who writes Leviticus, had the same problem. Despite being an incredible guy and achieving a lot, as we read about in in Exodus, he also was unable to enter the presence of the Lord. But what we see is this interesting interesting thing that happens throughout the book of Leviticus. In chapter 1, verse 1, it says that the Lord speaks to Moses from within the temple, i.e., God dwells in the temple, Moses is outside the temple. He cannot be in the presence of God. He's outside, he's cut off. And yet at the start of the next book, in Numbers chapter 1 verse 1, it says that the Lord God spoke to Moses in the temple. So something has happened, one of the ways that looking at Leviticus is tracking how does Moses go from outside of the temple and outside the presence of God at the start of the book, and how does he then get inside the temple at the start of the next book? There's been a change, there's been a shift. Something has happened here to allow Moses to make that move into the very presence of God. And we're going to look at that this morning. And in there lies the deep, we're not just here to work out how did Moses get there. We're also looking at, okay, how does this impact us? How can this holy, perfect God dwell with a sinful, imperfect person like me, people like us? But before we get to that, I want to be careful not to make too many assumptions of us because I think what we can do is we can skip over the the kind of questions within the questions in there and say, well, hang on a minute. Some of us wouldn't necessarily be on board with the idea that God is a holy God. You might have stuff going on in your life at the moment which is making you question his character. You might have experiences recently that make you go, really, is God really holy? Is he really perfect? Is he really good? What does it mean that he's holy? And also, what does it mean that we're not? You might not subscribe to the idea that's at the basis of this this morning, that human beings are unholy, that we're imperfect. You might be cool with the idea of a holy God, but you might not be on board with the fact that as as a human being, we are inherently disqualified from being able to be in the presence of this holy God. You might think, well, I've done some bad stuff, but I'm not that bad. There's people who are way worse than me. They should definitely not be allowed in, but I'm I'm all right. I'm pretty good. What about, or what about my neighbor who's a really good person and he does so many good things? Or what about her who does this amazing work over here? What about them? God's okay with a small bit of sin, right? Well, let's just dive quickly into those questions first before we look to answer the main question. So first of all, is God really that good? In Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah's a prophet who's going to come later in the Old Testament as we journey through the Bible. He declares, having seen God, he says, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. This is the only time when God is described in the scriptures where the phrase used to describe him is repeated for emphasis. God isn't just holy. God is really, really, really holy. It would be like if I said I could run fast compared to some of you. That might be true, compared to others of you, maybe not. But if I also said that Usain Bolt runs fast, I'd have to add something to how I described Usain Bolt to get you to really understand the difference. I might say that I run fast, but Usain Bolt runs really, really, really fast. God's holiness can be described also as his absolute moral purity. A website that called the Gospel Coalition puts it like this. God is not only perfectly good, He is the very source and standard of goodness. So it's not just that God is holy and good, but it's that he's so good and so holy that he defines what we mean by holy. You might be a good person, but I don't think many of us are going to be saying, oh, you want to know a really good person? Go and see Jason. Jason is the best person that I know in all areas of life. I'd really like Jason for the record. But I'm not using him as my standard for what a good person is, for who a good person is, or for what holiness is. Or put another way, to give us a different picture, uh, John describes it like this, 1 John 1, 5. God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. He's so pure that there is not even a hint, a shred, a speck of darkness in him. There's another website called Got Questions that summarizes his holiness like this. God is holy 
And in him there is not even the faintest trace of evil. He is impeccably pure, wholly without fault and uncompromisingly just. God cannot lie. He cannot make wrong decisions. He is blameless, timeless and sinless. Guys, I I can't even stand here and say to you that I'm blameless, timeless and sinless in the last five minutes. Like the stress of forgetting that we were not over there and in here this morning. So the words that went through my head that didn't quite come out of my mouth, praise God. I am not like this and neither are any of us. Neither are any of us. But even more incredibly than that, this holy God desires to be in relationship with you and me. His desire is to live with us and to use us to reproduce his holiness in the world, to fill the world with his glory and majesty. God is really, really holy. But what about us? As I've just described, I might have given you a clue. Are we really that bad? Why is it that we find our why is it we find it hard to wrap our heads around the idea of a holy God? I think it's partly because a holy God stands in quite stark contrast to who we are. I'm flawed. I'm imperfect. I'm un- none of this is surprising you. I'm not always good. And because we don't like focusing on those things, we don't then like to go to the other extreme and focus on just how holy God is. Because when we spend time there, we get a real, real check and a real, real view on just how unholy we are. And we can take this in different directions. Some of us are are so hard on ourselves that any moment just being able to think about something other than our flaws is a huge relief to us. But most of us spend our time low and down on just how rubbish we are. And we can label ourselves. We can label ourselves as unlovable, as not worth bothering with. Some of us, though, have the opposite problem. Some of us have just had the wall pulled over our eyes, mainly by ourselves. We fail to acknowledge that we're falling short of God's standard of holiness and that we're really, we kind of think there's quite a lot going around, particularly in our generation of sort of like this, we're on this progressive journey to being the best version of ourselves and that that's our standard that we've got to meet. Forget God, forget what he has to say. We just need to be the best version of ourselves. And we've got to, and it doesn't matter if we work towards that, if we trip up on the way, as long as we're heading in that direction, that's fine. That's a good life. Leviticus has some crazy moments in it that kind of give us a reality check on this. And, some of the, and one of those moments comes in chapter 10. You've got Aaron and his family in the tribe of Levi. This, this is the tribe that's in focus in the book of Leviticus. And they've been, they've been given a special task. They're to be the priestly people. From that tribe are the priests gonna come who are going to run the temple and give the sacrifices and make sure the presence of God remains with the people. They've been chosen as representatives. And so before they come and represent the people, they have to first make offerings for their own sin and they have to kind of deal with their own junk first before they're able to sort everyone else out. And one of their requirements among many is that they should not offer unauthorized incense on the altar. Again, this is where the unfamiliar language comes in. But basically there's something about how they're to do things that is to be proper and right and just as God has prescribed it. And in chapter 10, we meet Aaron's two oldest sons, Nadab and Abihu, who despite clear instructions, offer unauthorized incense on their burners, which are then sprinkled on the altar. So in amongst the many different requirements they've got, they've not paid attention. They've kind of just been a bit flagrant with the rules. They're kind of going, it's fine. Have you, do you not know Aaron's our dad? It's okay. We've done most things right. It's okay. Well, I don't know if that incense is right, but we'll just throw it on anyway. That's all they've done. But they've assumed too much. And Leviticus 10 verse 2 says this, that fire blazed forth from the Lord's presence and burned them up and they died before the Lord. It's these kind of moments that are jarring for us as modern readers, isn't it? We're not used to, we're used to Jesus coming to people and healing them up and sending them on their way. Moments like this are quite jarring. But it helps us remember and recognize what it means for human beings to come before a holy God without recognizing that they're different from him in that fundamental way that he is holy and we're not. And so to avoid more situations like Leviticus 10, we need a workaround. We need someone to get us from outside of God's presence to inside God's presence without any fire being involved in the process. And so did Moses and so did the people of God at the time. And so we see this solution that Leviticus uh, gives us. God has called us to be a holy people, which for some of us can feel like a, a standard that just is impossible to meet. It can feel like a weight that's too heavy 
to bear. It's not just about God being holy. He wants a holy people who can then partner with him in seeing his glory and his holiness fill the earth. And right in the middle of Leviticus, as the video said, which is ironically right in the middle of the book of, in the middle of the five books of the Torah. So some people describe Leviticus 16 as the hinge of the Torah, of the law, the first five books. Because right in the center, you've got this thing in Leviticus 16 called the Day of Atonement. A day when two goats are sacrificed for the sins of the people. One goat is killed and the other is cast out into the wilderness. Speaking of both how God makes us holy and the cost of that, and then how he removes our sin from us forever. And of course, we're not meant just to understand how this worked. This is not a history lesson. We're not meant to just understand how it worked for people back then, but we're also to see how all of this ultimately points us to King Jesus and how he makes us holy through his own work on the cross. Just going to read very quickly from Leviticus 16. We're going to read verses 15 and 16 and then verses 20 and 22. Then Aaron, remember, priestly people, must slaughter the first goat as a sin offering for the people and carry its blood behind the inner curtain. There he will sprinkle the goat's blood over the atonement cover and in front of it, just as he did with the bull's blood. Through this process, he will purify the most holy place and he will do the same for the entire tabernacle because of the defiling sin and rebellion of the Israelites. Then on to verse 20. When Aaron has finished purifying the most holy place in the tabernacle and the altar, he must present the live goat. He will lay both of his hands on the goat's head and confess over it all the wickedness, rebellion and sins of the people of Israel. In this way, he will transfer the people's sins to the head of the goat. Then a man specially chosen for the task will drive the goat out into the wilderness. As the goat goes out, it will carry all the people's sins upon itself into a desolate land. What's God's answer to the question of how a holy God can dwell with an imperfect people? It's a sacrifice and a scapegoat. Let's look firstly at the sacrifice. If you read through Leviticus this week, either in the Bible reading plan or if you choose to dive in a little bit deeper, you will see that a common occurrence in this book is blood and a lot of it. Sometimes it's blood from birds being sprinkled round rooms in a slightly strange manner. Other times it's goats. Other times it's being sprayed in all sorts of different places. But boy, oh boy, is there a lot of blood. And that's because without spilt blood, sorry for any of you who've got that thing where the thought of blood makes you want to pass out. Without, that, without the spilt blood of an innocent and spotless animal, it's our blood that would need to be spilt instead to make up for our sin. In order for unholy people to dwell in the presence of a holy God, payment needs to be made on people's behalf. God had told us this right back at the beginning. He told his people it right back at the beginning that the punishment for sin is death. The punishment for our wrongdoing towards God is death. Of course, there's a spiritual element to that. We're cut off relationally from God. That's part of our death in sin. But it also signifies the need for justice to be done. For, things, for wrongs to be made right. And so where there's sin, if we're to remove it, something or someone needs to die. And in all the ceremonial cleansing, the blood of this innocent animal would be sprinkled on the mercy seat. That was a place on top of the Ark of the Covenant where the presence of God dwelt. And that would allow the people to dwell in the presence of God and have him continue to dwell amongst them. But why is it that we no longer need to sacrifice animals here in church this morning? What's shifted there. Again, I've, uh, thankfully I've not robbed Long Down Dairy Farm of a few lambs on my way here and brought them along with me. It was because we worship and we come under the covering of the blood of the lamb. And that lamb is Jesus. Jesus who shed his blood once and for all and who died in our place on the cross. It's his blood that covers all of our sin, that stands over all time for every single person who puts their trust in him because he was the perfect, innocent sacrifice. In a song that uh, Charity Gale uh, has written called Thank You Jesus for the Blood, it says this, thank you Jesus for the blood applied. Thank you Jesus, it has washed me white. Thank you Jesus, you've saved my life. You've brought me from darkness into glorious light. We see that Jesus is our ultimate sacrifice and by his blood we've been rendered clean and innocent before a holy God. But we also see in Leviticus a second goat, and that's the scapegoat. Again, I'm stealing quotes a lot from Andy, but I thought this was really kind of a nice ring to it. What does a scapegoat do? The scapegoat takes the blame and deals with shame. 
takes the blame and deals with shame. The high priest would then take the second goat and lay hands on it and then would send that goat off out into the wilderness. There's different theories about exactly what this looked like. Uh, some would say it was taken so far away that it was just it was inevitable that this goat was going to get lost and never to be seen again. Other people wanted to be really, really sure that this goat was never going to... like. If you've just as a nation placed your hands on a goat and confessed the sins of the whole nation on this one goat, you send it out and then it reappears again a few days later. That's not going to be an ideal day for the people of God, is it? So sometimes what they would do is they would lead the goat to the edge of a cliff and let it wander over the cliff just so there's no chance of this thing reappearing. And you get the sort of finality of, right, sin has not just been paid for, sin has been taken away. Sin has been removed from the people. And therefore, God can dwell with them. And sometimes in church, we, we lay hands on people. Don't we? Not Again, not in that way. We lay hands on people to impart the Holy Spirit that... Oh, go on now. That was a good throw. Um, to impart what we carry within us in the Holy Spirit. So we might be praying for healing and we come along and we'd say, right, I'm going to lay my hands on you and believe that the Spirit who dwells in me is going to come and impact you and heal you or... Any, any other kind of impartation stuff that, that we do. It's a similar principle at work here, but it's not the Holy Spirit that's being imparted, but it's sin. This goat takes the blame and removes the shame. It's a, a common theme in the Bible, that this, uh, the sort of the casting out. We see it in Genesis. Adam and Eve are, are punished and then they're cast out of the garden. They're cast out of the presence of God. We see Cain is cast out of the land for murdering his brother. Israel, ultimately, as we're going to see later on in the story, they reach the promised land, but because of their sin, they're cast out of the promised land and they're exiled. I wonder if some of you this morning, you might feel cast out. You might feel on the edge of where you'd love to be. Maybe even this morning, you, you feel like you're here physically, but you're looking in on something that's going on for other people. That's because the shame of your sin feels like a, an impenetrable wall that you would never quite be able to overcome. The good news for you is that as well as Jesus being our sacrifice, he's also our scapegoat. All of our sin and shame is laid on him. We're told that in Hebrews 13. That Hebrews 13 literally tells us Jesus is our scapegoat. He is cast out. You know that moment where, and John refers to it later on as well, that moment where the, the people are crying out for Jesus to be crucified. Just before they ask for him to be crucified, they ask for him to be taken away. They say, take him outside the city and crucify him there. And so Jesus is led out of the, the city courts, having been beaten. He's led up the path to the mountain, which lives outside the city. Jesus is cast out on our behalf. He suffers that alienation that we so often feel, but that we don't have to carry anymore so that we can dwell in the presence of God. And that isn't just a, that is an individual thing, but let's be careful, it doesn't become an individualistic thing. God saves us into family. God saves us into community. Yes, he deals with our shame, but where does he bring us? He brings us into the presence of God and the presence of God's people. There's a corporate element to what he's doing as well. Again, the prophet Isaiah, Jesus was rejected by people, taken away and cut off, ultimately even from the land of the living. Jesus in dying experienced our being cut off so that we didn't have to. Anything that you're carrying around this morning, that you need to place on Jesus can be placed on him because he's also the scapegoat and he will take it away so that you can be in the presence of God and enjoy communion with him. Just as we respond, God is really, really, really holy. We are really, really, really not. We need Jesus. I do, you do. We need Jesus to wash us clean from sin and to remove our shame from us completely. But I just want to finish by asking why touched on at the beginning. Why does Jesus do, do this? Why does Jesus go through all the pain? Why doesn't he just leave it with animals being sacrificed and people kind of doing things once a year on the Day of Atonement? Why does he go through all that humiliation and suffering in our place? He does it because he loves us. The Bible says that the Father so loved you, so loved me in all our mess and in our shame that he sent Jesus. Jesus so loved you in all your mess and all your shame and me and all mine that he willingly became our sacrifice and our scapegoat. And you know how we know we're truly loved and truly free from sin and shame? It's through a fresh encounter with the Holy Spirit. 
the Holy Spirit who's here right now among us, who loves to come into our hearts and confirm all that these truths about God and all that he's done for us. So I'd love us just to stand before we worship. You can do that now, sorry. I'd love that's the rousing rally call. I'd love you to stand, everyone. And let's just invite the Holy Spirit to come. For some of us this morning, this is a moment to be reminded that shame no longer holds you because Jesus has removed your sin. It says elsewhere in the Bible, your sin has been removed as far as the east is from the west. I.e., you're never going to find it again, even if you went looking for it because Jesus has taken care of it. For others, it's a reminder, just the wonder and the holiness of God. But for some, you just need to open your heart to Jesus, maybe for the first time, and ask him to come and flood your life, to put your trust in him. Say, Jesus, come and take away my sin. Come and take away my shame and allow me to be in the presence of God, my Saviour. Holy Spirit, we do just invite you now. We surrender our hearts. We look afresh at Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for all you went through for us. We thank you, Lord, that you became our sacrifice, that you became our scapegoat, that we might know peace with God, that we might know relationship restored with you, that we might have access to this place called the presence of God that we never, ever deserved. But yet, by your grace, here we find ourselves. Come, Lord Jesus, and be revealed amongst us, we pray. Thank you.